Digibuy version 10 still supports influence coefficients balancing and soft bearing suspension balancing. This is an important distinction if you don't work with the balancing software very often. Um, first and foremost, understanding which method should be used for which applications. The influence coefficients method is kind of a general all-purpose in-situ balancing routine to be used on an assembled machine in place that you know you can't tear down, you can't necessarily take any measurements on. Um, that isn't going to be required for influence coefficients. Basically, the influence coefficients method of balancing only depends on your ability to apply a trial mass to the rotor and collect one initial recording with the machine as it sits, as you arrive at it in its initial state, and then a second recording with a trial mass applied. And the software will then look at the resulting difference that the trial mass has on both the unbalanced vibration and on the phase angle of the unbalance. And based on the resulting difference between those two runs, it will start to make corrections. The other method of balancing in version 10 is soft bearing suspensions, and that is specifically designed to be used with our soft bearing suspension balancing machines. Which are, gotta get stuff out of the way here. Of course, the full range of the balancing machines that we manufacture from the 30 kilogram capacity EI-30 all the way up to, well, what are we at now? Still 25 tons or are we going higher? No, we're doing a EI-50T right now for a company, a large power company down in South America, I think. Isn't that right, Luis? Okay. Uh, in, in capacity up to now 50 tons. Uh, regardless which of the balancing machines you're using, the capacity of that balancing machine, the soft bearing suspension method <clears throat> is designed to allow you the ability to specify a lot of measurements, the orientation of the rotor on the stand. So this is intended for single rotor balancing on the soft bearing suspension machine. <clears throat> I'm gonna go ahead and launch that and kind of walk through the balancing wizard in version 10 for the soft bearing suspension method. Um, any of you that have balancing machines or have customers that have balancing machines, of course, it's gonna be very important to understand how this is intended to work. First and foremost with the balancing wizard, you're gonna select the orientation of your rotor on the bearings. And what we're worried about here isn't necessarily the shape of the rotor per se. We are more concerned about the orientation of the correction planes available to us relative to the soft bearing suspension position. So in the graphic here, the two red triangles represent the general position of the soft bearing suspensions plane one and plane two, plane one on the left, plane two on the right. And then the graphic for the rotor itself is only gonna be representative of your correction planes and where they are relative to where the bearings are. So if both of your correction planes are between the bearings, this would be the orientation you would select. If you're doing something overhung, then depending on which way you orient it, whether it's to the left of the bearings or to the right of the bearings, and both corrections planes being outside the bearings. Now, something like a turbo rotor would probably be an orientation like this because both correction planes are outside of the soft bearing suspensions. And then potentially other types of turbo rotors with orientation, one between the bearings and one outside the bearings. So basically, first step is to define the orientation of your correction planes relative to wherever your soft bearing suspensions are. 
and then we do have to enter a lot of um, geometric information about the rotor, its orientation on the stand, and uh, the rotor mass in kilograms. These measurements, depending on whether you're in millimeters or inches, and probably the most important thing are our dimension measurements, A, B, and C. Dimension A is going to be from the center of the plane one soft bearing suspension to the plane one correction. Not necessarily the front surface of the rotor unless the correction plane is on the front surface of the rotor. Um, measurement B is from plane one bearing to your plane two correction. And then measurement C is from plane one bearing to plane two bearing. Those are all pretty straightforward. <clears throat> I forgot to put myself on do, do not disturb. <laughs> what one, of the most one of the most important things for everybody <clears throat> to understand about the soft bearing suspension wizard is that it doesn't require the use of a trial mass because we have the known geometry and mass of the rotor as well as the known mass and geometry of the soft bearing suspension. So we, we can calculate the influence coefficient based on those known variables and the running speed without having to use a trial mass. Right, correct. This allows you to jump right into immediate correction once you start the job because the software already has all the information it needs to calculate the influence coefficients. Uh, orientate, oh, I'm sorry, before we move on into that, let's talk about this last measurement, which is the radius measurement from center line of the shaft to the, now this is very important. This measurement distance, this radial distance, is from the plane, the, the center plane of the shaft to the plane of correction not necessarily the outer radius of the component. What that means is if we are dealing with something like, say for example, a spindle, we probably are not going to be making balance corrections to the outer radius of the spindle. We have balance holes available here on the leading face. And most often you are adding a screw or a part of a screw as your correction mass. And you're adding it at a distance that may only be a half inch from center. If that's the case, then if that's the case, then this radial distance measurement should be half an inch the location where you're going to be actually placing the correction mass. Now, if you are doing something like, let's say a fan, where the correction is going to be on the outer radius, maybe you're going to be shaving down a blade, something like that, then you would use the component's outer radius measurement to specify this distance. So basically what I'm trying to say here is that if you're familiar with the process of balancing, generally speaking, the same correction, it, well, let's see, the correction mass is going to need to be greater the closer that you get to the center shaft in order to achieve the same correction. Basically, Chris, you may want to just run through the rule of thirds. That might help everybody understand, too. Rule of thirds? Well, you want to affect the imbalance by one third. Oh, so yeah, 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 yeah. We're not to that yet. Okay, sorry. Yeah, that's okay. So basically, if you specify this as the outer radius of the component, this, this radius measurement, and you're making corrections closer to center, then the recommended corrections it's giving you for the outer radius 
will not be as effective when you're actually making the correction closer to center. And that can become very quickly frustrating if you don't understand why that's occurring. That's when I start getting phone calls about the fact that the software isn't calibrated properly, it isn't making the right recommendations. No, it's giving you a correction based on the radius that you specified and your corrections are actually going somewhere else. So your results will not be as accurate and it will be frustrating. <clears throat> uh, the rest of the information here in the left-hand panel, uh, apart from the rotor mass, direction of rotation. When we specify direction of rotation, it's important to understand that we are specifying that looking from the plane one accelerometer at plane one correction. Regardless which direction this rotor actually spins, that relative position is gonna give us our clockwise or counterclockwise rotation. Now, on a soft bearing suspension balancing machine, you plug the thing in, you turn on the motor, the motor always turns the same direction, the belt always turns the same direction, the rotor will always turn the same direction. But if your correction plane is on the inside of the bearing, your rotation might be clockwise. But if you hang a different type of rotor on here with the correction plane on the outside of the bearing instead of on the inside, then looking from plane one accelerometer at two plane one correction, the rotation's reversed now. Even though the rotor is still spinning the same direction on the stand as the last one, the correction plane has moved, your relative position has changed, and everything is now backwards. So you have to reverse your specified rotation to counterclockwise. Hopefully that makes sense. The important thing is to remember that we're always looking from plane one accelerometer at plane one correction to specify what direction our rotation is. And we'll specify that here. If you get this backwards, then the first correction you make will make the unbalance twice as bad as it was before and you'll pretty much know immediately that you've gone the wrong direction. The same applies to when you're actually making the physical corrections. The angles that are recommended in the software <clears throat> are going to be counted off from the red tape that the laser optical sensor reads being zero. It doesn't matter where the red tape lands, the red tape is always zero. And then your angles, your correction angles, are going to count off in the direction of rotation that you specified right here from zero. So if we are spinning clockwise from zero, then 90 degrees is at the top, 180 degrees off, 270 is at the bottom. If we are turning counterclockwise, then the angles are counting off in the opposite direction. 90 degrees is at the bottom, 180, well, of course, 180 out, and 270 is at the top, because the rotation is reversed. So when you start counting off the angles to make your corrections, make sure you're counting off the angles into the direction of rotation. And the remainder of the information down here in the soft bearing suspension setup, the G rating corresponds to ISO 1940-1 uh, standards. So if you're not familiar with those standards, basically ISO 1940-1 is a complete quality grade standard for rotor unbalance, rigid rotors. Generally speaking, we have this chart that we put together. It's pretty common. You can find it a lot of different places. We'll tell you that things like crankshafts, because of their inherent unbalance, have a much higher quality grade tolerance, up to a G40. Uh, most industrial equipment is going to run in the range of G6.3 to G2.5. Things like 
aircraft gas turbines, centrifuges, fans, gears, general machinery, paper machines, turbochargers, water turbines. This is this is predominantly most industrial rotors. The the unbalanced standard is a 6.3. Uh, smaller rotor assemblies that operate at higher speeds, things like machine tool drives, compressors, gas turbines, steam turbines, textile machines, they have a much lower unbalanced tolerance and their balance tolerance is G2.5. And of course this G designation is units of acceleration. So this is the unbalanced limitation in units of acceleration, 6.3 or 2.5. Uh, we do have a lot of customers that balance down to a G1 standard, which is not more than one G of vibration. But looking at the ISO 1940 standard, you're talking about something as precise as an audio video drive or a grinding machine drive. And the most aggressive or the, the highest tolerance of unbalance would be the G0.4, which is generally reserved for things like bindles of uh, drives and high precision systems like dental drills, gyroscopes, spindles, CNC spindles, for an example, typically are done to a G1. But there are people out there that get more aggressive and try and get it down even below that. And of course, the less unbalanced, the better. But the point of this is, this is a general guide to tell you what you should specify as the G rating you're trying to achieve for the type of equipment that you're balancing. Um, if you are doing a CNC spindle, yeah, maybe take it down to a G1 rating. If you are trying to balance a combine rotor for you know agricultural equipment, you will never get here. It's not possible. I mean, okay, maybe it's possible, but you'll be at it for days. Be realistic. Agricultural equipment is usually up in the 16 or maybe even the 40 range because it's not designed to run at high precision. Not really. So after we specify our G rating that we're trying to achieve, our unbalance, <clears throat> then we're also going to specify the nominal operating speed of the rotor. So the balancing machine is not going to be capable of spinning a rotor at 17, 18, 25, 100,000 CPM. They don't go that fast. And that doesn't really matter. What matters is that when we set up this job, we specify what the normal operating speed of the rotor would be in use. So if you're doing a turbo rotor, that turns at 100,000 CPM, you would put 100,000 CPM here. If you're doing a spindle that usually turns at 20,000 CPM, put 20,000 CPM here. Whatever the normal operating speed of the rotor is, is what goes in this block. And then specify if we're gonna be adding or removing mass to make our corrections. And then the last little piece of information here is the SBS calibration coefficient. This number represents the mass of the SBS pendulum component in the um, soft bearing suspension balancing machine in kilograms, which we have to factor out of the calculation. So this number is going to be dependent upon the size of the SBS unit that you're balancing on. This 0 0.320 value is the standard value for an EI-30. That's the machine that we sell the most of, so that's the default setting. But if you are balancing on something like an EI-300, an EI-1000, or larger, then we have a chart here to give you what the calibration coefficient should be for the SBS machine type. So in the off chance that you've got a customer who is um, trying to use the Digivibe system with a different company's soft bearing suspension balancing machine, this does come up occasionally. 
none of these values are going to correspond to their machine. These are all specifically the, the weighed mass of our SBS units. They can calculate what this value should be if they remove the soft bearing suspension component from their balancing machine and weigh it. Then they can enter that mass in kilograms here. Hey Chris, how does the um, the use of that you know that top spindle holder device does that affect the SBS coefficient? No, it does not. Okay. No, the negative load supports are really only there as a safety precaution to prevent the rotor from being able to jump off the bearings. Okay, thanks. Which would be quite a feat considering that these machines are all belt drive and they should be pulling directly down, holding the component on the bearing. But, I mean, if it's going crazy, yeah, it's better to be safe and have the negative load supports to ensure that there's no no ability for the, the shaft to jump vertically on the bearings and keep it seated. So no, it should not have any effect on this SPS value. Put a realistic value in here. Okay, 20, 20 kilogram rotor. So. We've got this rotor all set up now. This is kind of an important feature of the software. If this is a common rotor, if you've got a customer that's gonna be banging these out one after the next, or this is a rotor that you're gonna be doing repeatedly, you can save this setup so you don't have to go through and enter all this information again and again and again. Basically just give it a name, hit the save button. Yep, I'm gonna overwrite it. And you hit this drop down, you can see I have all these different rotor setups that I've already saved for various purposes. I'm going to do another one of these. All I got to do is just click and pull it up. What you would hope oh, for awesome, is, Chris. yeah, very helpful when you're doing rotor balancing, especially in a production environment that you can just load up a template and go. Yep. Um, and you can see here on the right hand side that generally speaking, this diagram should kind of match the orientation of your rotor on the SBS. It'll show you your center of gravities and your centers of unbalance. Go ahead and load this. So at this point, because we've already specified all this setup information ahead of time before we even started the job, we're ready to just spin and correct with the SBS method. We take our first round of recordings and what we get over here on the left hand side, the mass, angle, and quality, the mass is the recommended correction mass after the run. The angle is the recommended correction angle after the run based on whether you specified that you are adding or removing mass. So that's how much mass to adjust and this is where to adjust it. And the quality indication, whatever number comes up here is related to this G tolerance that you specified for the job. So if your unbalanced tolerance is 6.3 and we come up with a quality of less than 6.3, after the run, you're going to be in the green. If it's slightly more than 6.3, it'll be yellow. If it's way out of 6.3, it'll be red. And you'll see that indication on both planes. And basically, you get corrections plane one, plane two, run right through, and just spin and correct, spin and correct, spin and correct until you get the quality to green. And that is the soft bearing suspension method. Influence coefficients, let's go back to that for just a second. Put a new balance, influence coefficients, specify if we're going to do two simultaneous planes, single or two plane. Okay, so influence coefficients, there's no setup because influence coefficients doesn't care doesn't need to know anything about the configuration of the rotor, doesn't need to know anything about the mass, does not care. In order to step through an influence coefficients balance, 
we're already set up for our first run, we're going to open the balancing calculator. And basically the balancing calculator provides us the tools to step through and influence coefficients balance. The one plane tab will show you the corrections for single plane, either in plane one or plane two, your choice. If you're going to only do a single plane, then probably you're only going to have data for one plane. If you're going to do a two plane balance, then you use the two plane tab. The difference between them is that for a single plane correction, you really only need to do two runs to make corrections. You do your initial state run, the way the machine is when you arrive, plug those values in, this little red arrow will pull up the run history. So you take your first recording, hit the red arrow, you'll see an initial run there, select it, and it'll autofill this. Then you apply a trial mass. Specify the amount of mass that you used and the angle where you placed it. I recommend zero because zero is the most definitive angle you have. It's where your red tape is. You know for a fact where zero is. All other angles may not as be as accurate unless you have a really accurate way to, me uh, to measure them. <clears throat> Specify rotation and and if you need a really accurate way to measure them, you can always you can use, use the Bluetooth angle meter. Yeah, the Bluetooth angle meter or the inclinometer will allow you to have a more precise indication. Um, basically, what it does is it correlates where zero is to a zero position on the angle meter, and then it puts this red dot indicator on the outside of the polar plot. And then after your first recommended correction, this red dot will move to the recommended correction location and you can just rotate the rotor and the angle meter together and get this to a position where you can make the correction. Maybe roll this so that the red dot lands at 12 o'clock and you know to make your correction right at 12 o'clock. Um, so that gives you your first correction. It looks at the resulting difference between the initial and the trial run. What you need to accomplish, this is very important when you're doing an influence coefficients balance. You have to accomplish one of two things with your trial run. That trial mass has to either change your vibration by 30% or change the phase angle of the unbalance by 30 degrees. One of those two things, doesn't matter if it goes up or down, doesn't matter exactly where the phase angle moves to, but you've got to get either a 30% change in the unbalance or a 30 degree change in phase in order to get accurate correction mass recommendations. If you do not get a good trial run, adjust your trial mass, take another collection and plug those values in. So once you've got 30% or 30 degrees, those two values in, hit calculate, and you'll get your first trial mass or your first correction recommendation. Um, also important, in most cases you're applying a trial mass that you can immediately remove thereafter. But in some situations you may have a choice. You may have to just tack a piece of plate on a fan and you're stuck with it. You can't take it back off once you put it on. If that's the case, then you click this stays block and the software will account for the fact that this trial mass you specified has to be corrected for now. Make your first correction, whatever's recommended here in the correction mass, and then click the tuning block and you go into tuning. And you just continue to take recordings and make corrections until you achieve the unbalance that you're looking for. Awesome, thanks Chris, that was, uh, that was really helpful.